You're probably wondering how to get your students ready for some of the new exam items the National Registry has recently put into the exams. We need to have our students prepared. We don't want them surprised and mess up their head with these new kind of questions. And quite frankly, I think there's some educational benefits to these questions as well. I'm Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. I'm going to show you some of the things we've done and ways you could integrate these into your classroom. Now you'll see on the screen, I call these critical thinking sequencing, prediction, ultimately psychomotor. The National Registry wants to do away with the psychomotor exam and we say, well, how do we test some of the things we looked for in the psychomotor exam? Well, there's a question on your screen you'll see right now. A paramedic in a first response vehicle, 75 year old, malaise and abdominal discomfort. She responds and appears oriented. So let's ask a question. Which of the following actions would you perform first based on the patient presentation? All right, so now these aren't the kind of questions where you're looking for a fact, you're looking for a judgment. It's not time for the EKG. It's not time for administering oxygen. She responds to you. So looking for airway swelling or obstruction, you could easily go, oh, ABCs, but the truth is she responds, you know it's not that. What gives you some information here? I think skin color and condition. So let's go on to the next question and watch how we build here and look at the types of questions. Now remember, we won't match the exact visual experience your student gets on the National Registry, but we can simulate the experience of getting sequential information over time, multiple questions about the same patient as we build that information. And let's look for some deeper judgment and thinking when we do this. All right, so the next question, still the same information, same 75 year old woman, malaise, discomfort. She responds, that's great. Which early finding would give you the best indication of the patient's overall level of criticality? Well, if we're looking at this, we always have to read the question. We're looking for criticality. And in this case, I'm going for mental status. Pulse oximetry is good. It'll show hypoxia, severity of abdominal pain. Doesn't always match criticality. Lung sound, sure, we'll get lung sounds. But when you're looking at the patient in this early stage, what's going to, what should set off your alarm that says there's a problem here? That would be mental status. I think you can see where we're going with this. All right, now. We sequentially add information. So what we've done, and what I believe you can do in your exams, is to take the information that you gave originally, leave it there, and then take, and we put bold in here so you see what's new, all right? One of my concerns in these things, as uh, in the registry, you'll see you go from tab to tab, and you get a lot of information. Uh, we need to take our students that have trouble focusing, that have trouble reading, and give them the ability to process all this information, and make the right decisions. So throw in a multiple response item here, based on this additional information, which two of the following five conditions should be in your early differential diagnosis? This is a good question, right? This is how we want our students to think. So you get a little bit more information, right? Hasn't felt well for a couple of days. It's gradual. Abdominal pain is vague. Slightly elevated pulse and respiratory rates just in your primary assessment. Don't have the numbers yet, but just say, gee, they're really kind of up there. Warm and dry skin setting at 97%. So two of the following five. Uh, it's my belief the National Registry generally always has three wrong answers. And then you'll pick either two or three correct answers. All right. She has vague abdominal pain. That's not peritonitis. Ruptured esophageal varices are a horrible bleeding mess. She doesn't have that. Acute coronary syndrome. She's 75, abdominal pain. I'm not ruling that out. Hypoglycemia, warm, dry skin, gradual onset, no. Hyperglycemia, oh yeah. I've got to choose two. I need to be able to rule things in and rule them out based on what I just told you. So I'm going to submit that. Now, we're not giving the answers here because the National Register doesn't give you answers, right? So let's add some information. Here's the vital signs. Pulse is 96, right? Don't go with that, oh, gee, it's not tachycardia. It's not 100. That's fast. Respiratory to 20. That's not good. And 104 on 80 is actually a narrowed pulse pressure. 
Will your students get that? They should. It's important in a patient. So which additional information may be most helpful to now or your diagnosis? You know, this is a medical patient. You know, lung sounds may or may not do cardiac. EKG gives you cardiac. Palpating the abdomen, which, uh, which would be most helpful to narrow my differential diagnosis? I'm going with the history. This is a medical patient. Sometimes patients have today what's wrong with them, what's been wrong with them in the past. Imagine a test question that makes you think like that. So now, with the same information, there's those vital signs. Which of the following statements in reference to the patient's vital signs represents her current condition? Cardiac issue? No. Uh, normal limits? No, no, no. I'm concerned about shock. I am. I would initiate rapid transport. I'm not confident about that yet because she's oriented. So you got to go back and look at all the information now. So she's oriented. I'm, I'm concerned about shock because of a pulse of 96, respiratory rate of 20, and a narrowed pulse pressure. All right, so that's my answer. Okay, oh, look, images. We know we have images. Oh, we have new information because it's bold. Denies chest pain or discomfort. Okay, but she's older, could still be cardiac. History of diabetes and hypertension. That diabetes has always been on my mind. Hypertension is a risk factor. Takes a you know, pretty potent uh, antihypertensive and an oral medication, so she says type 2 diabetic. Lungs are clear, no JVD or pedal edema. I like that because if I look at this, I look at that blood pressure, anything else, if I want to give fluid, those things are important. So it looks like I've got a little bit longer than a six second strip here. Um, and I'm going to go through and interpret this. I won't make you listen to me do this, but we've got a sinus rhythm here. So we've worked in EKG interpretation. So now with this information we have, um, we've taken the diabetic history, everything else. So if you were to direct your team to do one additional test, what would it be? Well, heck, I'm going for, you know, skin turger. You know, she's old, this is gonna be a little bit challenging anyways. A stroke scale, there's nothing to indicate that, but boy, with that history of diabetes, that vague abdominal pain, narrowed pulse pressure, you know, I want my, I'm thinking, whoa, she's, you know, could be dehydrated, you know, might have a high blood glucose. And I want my students to be able to think like this. If you've been a little skeptical about how does this really show if students can put things together? How does this really show if they can do it like the practical exam did? The practical exam can measure skills, but otherwise we're really looking for thinking. In the oral stations, you know, whatever you're, you're the integrated out of hospital, ultimately we're looking for them to think more than we are to do because we've tested their skills out in class. So, oh, look at that. Blood glucose of 391. Patient becomes slightly dizzy as she tries to stand up. Okay, to an experienced person, that's not a surprise. To a student, what does that mean? Well, she's a little low on volume. Which of the following findings uh, would you expect? Well, I think that the three P's are going to tell me she's going to be thirsty, right? Um, she's not going to have scant urine. She's probably peeing a lot. It's why she's dehydrated. And I'm going to say thirst because she's hyperglycemic. And we're looking in things that we should expect. We're predicting things we might find to see if our students know. Okay, your management of this patient saline bolus, corticosteroids, uh, lock, or glucagon. Well, she glucose is high enough. What do we want? Well, we've already know she has clear lung sounds, no pedal edema, no JVD. Um, I think that she needs a little bit of fluid. That's some of our management. All right, now the last question, right? You see how we've built here. We did a 10 question scenario. You're a paramedic in a first response vehicle. We got all that. Now we have no new information. And let's look about predicting. Which of the following treatments would you expect to be initiated at the emergency department that wouldn't be instituted in the field? Now, we, we're not teaching people to be emergency docs, but can they look ahead? Can they decide why they want to send someone somewhere or what they want to do? All right, NPO for immediate surgery. Okay, there's abdominal pain. So you make choices choosable. You know, but is there really have an abdominal issue here? You know, it's not the top of the list anymore. Dialysis, well, I mean, could you have a profound 
hyperglycemic patient and do some of that? Yeah, but I don't think she's there yet because she's got a good mental status. Insulin infusion, though, we may want to bring that down. Calcium gluconate, that's not it. I think the hospital is going to do this. Now, why is this important? Because the, the AEMT or paramedic should be able to say, well, I can't do that in the field, but that's ultimately what they'll do to get a blood glucose that's almost 400 down. But I've got to bring them in a place, you know, they're probably might be in the, even in the ICU for a little bit. This has got to be monitored. Insulin is a, is a big thing. And being able to predict and look forward and make a hospital choice and, and continue to make good decisions, we often fight this question because we say, well, we don't need to know that. The hospital does that. No, no, no. We need to be able to predict what the patient will need. We need to understand pathophysiology and what will ultimately fix it, even if we don't do it. Well, look, in this case, uh, we got 100%. Um, what I really wanted to do in this was to give an example of how we can create items in a class that make our students do the things that we talked about in this scenario, critical thinking, sequencing, what do we do first, second, or last, what's most important, what's least important, some prediction, and even some psychomotor, and when do we do skills and how they're important. We teach a lot of that. Here's the skill. Integrating it and when to do the skill is really important, and I believe that we can do that uh, with a written exam. Um, Limer Education is working, uh, as we've always done, to be able to get you better experiences for your students through our products, as well as help you create better items in the classroom and give your students a better experience in this. We've had a lot of transitional times in exams and education standards and accreditation. We need to work together to make this happen. I'm Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. You can find us at limmereducation.com. Email support at Limmer Education if you'd like more or if you have any questions. I hope to be seeing you out there sometime soon.